Speaker of the House John Nance Garner was one of the few serious essential contenders ever willing to accept a second place on the ticket. In 1932, when it became obvious that he could not beat Roosevelt, the third ballot released tickets and FR was nominated. Garner served two terms, and for the first four years was a tower of political strength in pushing through the original New Deal legislation. Garner was quite content to be the number two man and promised that as long as he was vice president, he would never make a single speech. And as this scene indicates, even FDR couldn't coax him into one. Captain, I agreed with you when I went into the cabin that I wouldn't make a speech, and I'm not going to make one now. <laughs> But later, the honeymoon ended when Garner began to oppose the second term program as going too far. Progressive enough and willing enough for the third term was Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace. A future vice president named Barclay asked a slightly reluctant convention to make it unanimous. Henry Wallace, unanimous. As many as favor the motion, say aye. Contrary, no. As did Garner, Wallace sat with the Roosevelt cabinet, and more than that, the president sent him as his eyes and ears abroad, making wartime trips to Latin America and China. He was also chairman of the Board of Economic Warfare. But by 1944, it was obvious that Wallace was considered too much of a liability for renomination. Harry Truman, the junior senator from Missouri, went to that Chicago convention, committed to nominate Jimmy Byrne, and ended up by being told that he was Roosevelt's personal choice for the vice presidency. After the fourth term victory, there was that cold, rainy morning when Roosevelt came back to Washington and rode beside the man who might have been and the man who did become the next president of the United States. It's a very wonderful welcome home that you have given me on this rather rainy morning. A welcome home that I shall always remember. And when I say a welcome home, I hope that the, uh, some of the scribes in the papers won't intimate that I expect to make Washington my permanent residence for the rest, residence for the rest of my life. <laughs> but Washington was to be his home for the rest of his life. 82 days after the inauguration, Franklin Roosevelt was dead of a cerebral hemorrhage, and Harry Truman was taking the oath of office, totally unaware that he was becoming the first president of the atomic age. Later, important critics in the opposition suggested that Mr. Truman was only acting president, as Tyler's critics had said in 1841. The issue was finally answered in the 22nd Amendment, which confirmed Tyler's interpretation. In 1948, Two Democrats refused to concede that Dewey and Warren were unbeatable. One was Harry Truman, who ran for president. The other was Senator Albin W. Barkley, aged 70, who ran for vice president. The beat, as he liked to be called, not sat in the cabinet, but became the first vice president to be privy to the secret affairs of state as a statutory member of the National Security Council, thus becoming the first really well-informed vice president in our history. In 1952, Eisenhower, Taft, Warren, and Stassen fought for the Republican presidential nomination. But there was only one candidate for the vice presidency, and it was Senator William Noland of California who made the nominating speech. To present to this convention as a candidate for the vice presidency of the United States, my junior colleague in the Senate. Senator Richard Nixon of California. On January 20th, 1953, Richard Nixon became the 36th Vice President of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations, Vice President. He has been a busy one, and a useful one to the President, who has constantly tried to enhance the prestige of the office. Like Barclay, he sits with the National Security Council, and he also presides over the cabinet in the president's absence. On May 31st, 1955, President Eisenhower told a news conference 
a Richard Nixon had been selected. James Reston of the Times asked the question. I would be uh, glad to give it to you. Uh, as I reminded you people before, my experience in politics has been a little intensive, even if short. And uh, the first thing I knew about a president having any great, or presidential nominee, having any great influence in the vice presidential selection was, I think, about the moment that I was nominated. And uh, I wrote down, I said I would not do it. I didn't know enough about the things that have been going on in the United States. I've been gone two years. And so I wrote down five, the names of uh, five, or maybe it was six men. Younger men that I admired that seemed to me to have made a name for themselves, and I said, any one of these will be acceptable to me, and he was on the list. Could I pursue that? Could you recall who were the five men? <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, what I was trying to get at was, what, what is your philosophy about the role of the nominee in the selection of the vice president? Is it your view that the, the convention is sovereign? It can pick anybody it's li it likes, or should it, in your judgment, follow the recommendation of the presidential nominee? Well, I would say this, Mr. Reston. It seems obvious to me that unless the man were, as chosen, were acceptable to the presidential nominee, the presidential nominee should immediately step aside. Because we have a government in this day and time when uh, teamwork is so important, where uh, abrupt changes could uh, make so much difference, that if a president later, is suddenly uh, uh, disabled or uh, uh, killed or dies, it would be fatal, in my opinion, if you had a tense period on, not only to introduce now a man of an entirely different philosophy of government, but he, in turn, would necessarily then uh, get an entirely new cabinet. I think you'd have chaos for a while. So I believe if there wouldn't, if there isn't, some kind of, uh, of general a uh, closeness of feeling between these two, it's an impossible situation, at least the way I believe it should be run. I personally believe that pre the Vice President of the United States should never be a known entity. I believe he should be used, I believe he should be, uh, have a very useful job, and I think that ours has. Ours has worked uh, as hard as any man I know in this whole uh, uh, executive department. Next, we went down to Paducah, Kentucky, to ask former Vice President Alban W. Barkley what changes he would recommend in the manner of selecting vice presidents? Well, I think that so long as you have the, the, uh, the convention system and you have hot, uh, warm, bitter contests for the nomination for president of the United States, the probability will be that the nominee for president, consulting his party leaders after his nomination has been uh, consummated, will continue to choose the vice president according to uh, geography or expediency or political conditions. Whereas in a primary election, where the people would choose both of the nominees, they would be in a position more deliberately, I think, to uh, look at the qualifications of both the candidate for president and vice president. Of course, I have long believed that there ought to be a popular nomination of both president and vice president and his popular election rather than through the outmoded, antiquated electoral college system. I do not know that this re reform or revision or change will come about uh, in the near future, but uh, our trend over the years has been gradually to give the people more power in the selection of their governmental officers. The Constitution was amended back in 1912, I think, to provide for the popular election of senators rather than by the legislatures. That has been successful, and uh, the people would not think of changing back to the old legislative uh, log-rolling process by which senators were chosen. Now, I've always felt, and I feel very strongly, that the people are just as wise in the selection of a president and vice president as they are in the selection of a governor, or a United States senator, or their congressman, or any other public officers whom they have the right to choose. And therefore, I favor, and have long favored, a nationwide primary election at which all the people in a given political party can vote for the man whom they wish to nominate and wish later to elect as President of the United States, and the same rule that would be applied to the Vice Presidency. And for the same reason, I have long felt that uh, 
the Electoral College was an antiquated, outmoded piece of political machinery. Former Vice President Henry Wallace is now developing a new strain of poultry and experimental strawberries at South Salem, New York. We asked him about the Vice Presidency. There have been times in the United States when the Vice President stood for one thing in the Senate and the President stood for another thing, another set of policies in the White House. I can recall, for instance, that uh, uh, Vice President Dawes stood for a very different policy in the Senate than uh, Coolidge stood for in the White House. Dawes had been chosen to placate the farm block, and he entertained the farm leaders in his office. I was one of those entertained at the time. And uh, Coolidge uh, had no sympathy, whatever, with what Daw Dawes was doing in the Senate. In a uh, somewhat like manner, uh, uh, Garner stood for quite a different policy in the Senate uh, from that which Roosevelt uh, uh, stood for in the White House. Uh, these troublous times won't permit uh, that kind of a situation, in my opinion. This uh, does not call for an amendment, but does call for an increasing sense of awareness on the part of both the general public and the delegates to the national conventions. The former president and vice president, Harry Truman, lives in Independence, Missouri, has his office in Kansas City. Mr. Truman, do you think the method of selecting vice president should be changed? It's a very difficult question for the simple reason that it's been studied for a long, long time. It was changed in the beginning by the 12th Amendment, if you remember. And uh, we've been studying it both in the Congress and outside the Congress to find a better way to elect a pr president and a vice president. No better way has yet come up. I hope one may and will. What about the suggestion of a direct primary. The direct primary is an ideal situation for selecting public officials, but there isn't a man in the world with money enough to put on a direct primary for president and then run for president. It would require an immense amount of money in each one of the states, and I'm not so sure that it would obtain the results that we think about. Primaries in some states have been very satisfactory, and others that have not. Um, for the direct primary, however, in the state of Missouri. How do you feel about the Smathers resolution? that if the president should die during the first two years of his term of office, that a new election should be held coincident with the off-year election for Congress. Well, I hadn't, give that, I hadn't given that any thought of study, and I can't answer it intelligently. I have been of the opinion that if the, when the president uh, goes out of office for any cause, whatever, during his term, and the vice president takes over, it might be a good thing to call together the electors who were elected in the last presidential election to elect the vice president to take the place of the vice president who had gone to the White House. And in order to do that, you have to have a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution of the United States. In any change affecting any one of those two offices, or any one of the top offices of the government, would require a constitutional amendment, particularly with regard to the president and the vice president. Do you find the language of the Constitution a little obscure now as to whether the duties or the office devolve upon the vice president in case of... I think, I think it's perfectly plain in the Constitution that the vice president becomes the president of the United States, and that is established by John Tyler, the first vice president to take over. One of your ancestors, I believe, wasn't he? Well, he was the uncle of my great-grandmother. Mr. President, you say in your book that when you became president, you did not know about the atom bomb. Is it your feeling that the vice president should always be thoroughly informed of all aspects of the executive functions of the government? That's absolutely true. He should be. But the reason I didn't know about the atomic bomb, that was the best kept secret that any government ever had, and it was necessary to keep it secret. I was informed as far as I could be from the time I became vice president until I became president, but that only lasted 82 days, and I wasn't fully broken in as a, a vice president in that time. And Senator Barclay became vice president of the United States, and. When I was president, Senator Barclay was kept completely informed on everything that went on foreign and domestic. And he was a wonderful vice president and never violated the confidence. That's one of the difficulties that the president has in talking about his, the business of the government to anybody outside his immediate circle. I suppose because everyone's looking for a headline. That's absolutely true. And of course, the vice president, as I said in the book, is very much surrounded by the best politicians in the world, I think. The United States Senate is the best association of politicians I know of, 
They're all fine men. But when they have a chance to uh, scoop the rest of the senators, they can't resist the temptation. Since 1841, this nation has been headed 21% of the time by men never elected as president. Ten of our 34 vice presidents have become president, seven through the accident of death. In some cases, they have surpassed in ability the men they succeeded. But nevertheless, the manner of selecting vice presidential candidates remains an afterthought. The founding fathers were determined that the vice president should be the second best qualified man in the country. Under the present system, a man may become president whose qualifications have not been examined fully, either by the people of the country or by his own political party. The importance of the office of vice president has increased. The care with which the candidate is selected has not increased. The future of Western civilization may be determined by tired politicians, exhausted after a long struggle to nominate a presidential candidate, and then indifferent to the gamble they take when they nominate the man who may succeed him. Many suggestions have been made as to methods of altering the selection of vice presidential candidates. But this would seem not to be a matter of machinery, but of standards. No law can guarantee that the second best man will hold the second highest office in the land. We have presented this report on the vice presidency in the hope of stimulating discussion of the methods of selection used by both political parties, and in the hope, perhaps vain, that at the next conventions, the delegates and the citizens will remember that it is no minor matter to us and to the free world, who is selected as vice presidential candidates for both parties. Good night and good luck.